Well, I should say thank you, Professor Fu, for this um, invitation. Um, it's great. It's a great pleasure to share the stage with such um, esteemed colleagues. So specifically today, um, I want to talk about Syria, about the crisis in Syria. Uh, surely, I suppose, probably the largest humanitarian crisis um, currently, well over a million refugees have been displaced from the Syrian borders. Over four million within the context of Syria are being displaced from their homes. Um, but specifically, I wanted to talk about the chemical attack that happened on August 22nd. So although we can think through this contemporary example as a way to, I want to use this con the contemporary example as a way to think through two kinds of points. And although they're related and they are sort of a slippery slope between them, I want to maintain a distinction between these two points. First, it's, this is a really kind of a, a bit of an oversimple talk, but first I want to think about the remarkable new mediums through which contemporary human rights claims get made. In this case, um, cell phone footage, largely, that was uploaded and shared and circulated through YouTube and other social media platforms. The second point is the way in which we, you and I, enter this political drama, which is to say the way in which the act of watching the videos serves as the very ground of politics in the 21st century. And specifically in this case, the way in which watching quickly became the grounds for appeals for humanitarian intervention, largely led by the Obama administration. So in a phrase, then, to bring these two things together, I want to think about the ways in which regarding the pain of others transforms us into world spectators. And those of you that know Susan Sontag's work will know that I borrowed her title, the title of her last book, Regarding the Pain of Others, and that the idea of the world spectator is an old one, and thanks, Josh, for <laughs> goes at least, at least back to Kant, and I'll say a little bit about this lineage in a moment, but suffice to say, when thinking about human rights claims and when thinking about humanitarian intervention, and that's the distinction I'm going to try to hold on to today, I think we're obliged to think about spectatorship, that the activity of watching has become one of the chief modes of being political. Okay, so first, the videos. Uh, on the morning, well, the, the Syrian crisis has gone, goes back a few years now. It, it, it is connected, as you, many of you know, to the Arab Spring and that there was a, a pop popular uprising. Various groups within Syria um, started calling for the end of the Assad regime. The crisis, I suppose, had a new peak uh, on August 21st, 2013, when a chemical weapons, and specifically a nerve agent sarin attack, was used on the Ghouta agricultural region just outside of Damascus. Dozens of videos were uploaded to YouTube documenting the aftermath of the attack within hours. Large numbers of distressed and visibly sick adults and children with no external signs of injury. Both independent and major news networks began recirculating these videos uh, the same day. So I'll show you, for example, the BBC News. <laughs> These are some of the scenes now circulating on the internet of distressed children apparently suffering the after effects of a chemical attack. Some of the video footage is too distressing to broadcast and it is unverified. But there are scores of dead, among them very young children. So that's just an example, but as you probably know from your own watching, almost every major news broadcast started showing, and re they were recirculating these videos that were being uploaded um, onto YouTube. The next sort of move, I guess, on the chessboard was when, um, or one of the moves anyway, is jo when John Kerry, Secretary of State, gave uh, a press briefing, he gave what the, he calls remarks on Syria, and he then addresses them in, this, in the White House press conference. His language was particularly strong in this case, and if you recall from Professor Slaughter's talk, the, where this language comes from, he says that what we saw in Syria last week should shock the conscience of the world. That's a clear reference to the uh, Declaration of Human Rights. And he calls the attack a moral obscenity. And he spends a long time talking specifically about the videos. And all nations <clears throat> who believe in the cause of our common humanity must stand up to assure that there is accountability for the use of chemical weapons so that it never happens again. Last night, after speaking with foreign ministers from around the world about the gravity of this situation, I went back and I watched the videos, the videos that anybody can watch in the social media.
and I watched them one more gut-wrenching time. It is really hard to express in words the human suffering that they lay out before us. As a father, I can't get the image out of my head of a man who held up his dead child, wailing while chaos swirled around him. The images of entire families dead in their beds without a drop of blood or even a visible wound. Bodies contorting in spasms. Human suffering that we can never ignore or forget. Anyone who could claim that an attack of this staggering scale could be contrived or fabricated needs to check their conscience and their own moral compass. So then a week later, the White House, President Obama gives his own address on Syria. I love this, it's the newest uh, disclaimer on the White House website. <clears throat> so this may not be up to date. But um, they put together a, a, their own web page. This is the White House's um, website, which included, as part of the briefing, a collation of 13 of these videos. And Obama himself addresses the video specifically in his address. You'll note the similarity of language and the particular things that they're My fellow Americans, asking you to attend to. In the tonight video. I want to talk to you about Syria, why it matters, and where we go from here. Over the past two years, what began as a series of peaceful protests against the repressive regime of Bashar al-Assad has turned into a brutal civil war. Over 100,000 people have been killed. Millions have fled the country. In that time, America has worked with allies to provide humanitarian support, to help the moderate opposition, and to shape a political settlement. But I have resisted calls for military action because we cannot resolve someone else's civil war through force, particularly after a decade of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. The situation profoundly changed, though, on August 21st, when Assad's government gassed to death over 1,000 people, including hundreds of children. The images from this massacre are sickening. Men, women, children lying in rows killed by poison gas, Others foaming at the mouth, gasping for breath. A father clutching his dead children, imploring them to get up and walk. On that terrible night, the world saw in gruesome detail the terrible nature of chemical weapons and why the overwhelming majority of humanity has declared them off limits, a crime against humanity, and a violation of the laws of war. So surely there is much to be said about this sequence of events, the attack, the documentation of its aftermath, and the uses of that documentation. But as I said, for today, I just want to tease out two related issues. First is the way in which Syrian citizens were able to quickly document and broadcast this crime of war using smartphones, something that we all probably carry with us here today. This is one way in which human rights claims are made in the 21st century. Obviously, this act is not equivalent to filing a legal complaint or launching a case at the International Criminal Court in The Hague, but it certainly does constitute an attempt to claim that an atrocity has been committed against the civilian population. The presence of children in the videos does particularly potent work in this regard, since one is hard-pressed to identify these subjects as rebels, terrorists, insurgents, or any other category of combatant. They are undoubtedly civilians in the language of the Fourth Geneva Convention, which sets out the protections that are afforded to civilians in times of war. In this respect, the Syrian case shows that rights claims have become a thoroughly visual practice. Indeed, more generally, one could say that the politics occurs at the level of the Scopic regime. Now, with regard to the second point, we must also be attentive to the way third-party political powers, in this case, the Obama administration, mobilizes and positions these claims as the ground for humanitarian military intervention. And I was, just as a side, I was thinking as, I'll, I'll come back to that. I had a, a kind of a comment that I was gathering uh, from the previous two talks, but. So this particular response, that is the Obama administration's, leans upon the idea that the significance of the videos is visible in their manifest content. 
And further, that our emotional reactions to them, both Obama and Kerry are very clear about telling us that, that we should be sickened mm -hmm. by them, which is a kind of subtle moral training that our, our appropriate spectator's response is one to be sickened. <clears throat> this is evidence as, of their veracity. The videos, therefore, demand a response. Obama uses spectators' responses to the videos as the staging ground for his claim that the US should conduct a targeted missile attack on the sites of Assad's stash of chemical weapons. So to underscore this again, and I, as I said, this is a bit of a simple-minded paper. This exemplar suggests that there's a deep and mutually constitutive relationship between the visual and the political fields. In a way, the political work was curatorial by the Obama administration, literally a curatorial. They stringed together 13 videos for, as evidence. And we can think of this exemplar in terms of what Judith Butler calls the frames of war, the way sovereign powers have attempted to delimit what appears in the field of view, controlling the very terms of representability. Or we might more simply say that there is a political economy at work in these visual practices. Now it might seem that these matters of human rights and spectatorship are particularly modern, and on one hand I think we do have to attend to the specifics uh, of their contemporaneous, the, the advent of the digital and what that means. But I also think we need to take a long view of this phenomenon. For instance, more than two centuries ago, and I'm gonna be the historian just for this part. On April 2nd, 1792, another passionate statesman, William Wilberforce, also delivered another major speech, this time in the British Parliament, about the atrocities happening far from home. Wilberforce's speech was in support of a motion to abolish the slave trade. He'd been campaigning for the end of slavery for more than a decade. When he introduces his, this bill the second time in, in 1792, he leans on a rhetorical strategy that was remarkably akin to President Obama's. Aside from relying on closely reasoned argument, Wilberforce played directly to emotion. His aim was to get the members of the two houses of parliament to experience the misery of slavery as disgraceful to their feelings. That's his words. He wanted them to squirm in their seats, to be outraged and to outrage the conscience of their humanity. Wilberforce touched on several narratives of horrific suffering, including the story of a single girl. It's so it's like the same strategy as um, Obama and Kerry. They single out a, a particular um, figure, as opposed to th speaking en masse. In this case, a single girl mortally beaten by the captain of her slave ship for allegedly refusing to dance on the ship's deck, which was the common means of forced exercise for the slaves. Let me read to you a bit from the minutes of the meeting where Wilberforce gets up and makes this remark. It's, it's recorded, his remarks are recorded in third person. <clears throat> he could have wished forever to drop all recital of facts which tended to prove the cruelty of those who dealt in this abominable traffic. But there was one instance in which he could not omit in this case. The instance he should mention was the case of a young 15-year-old girl of extreme modesty who finding herself in a situation indecent to her sex was extremely anxious to conceal it the captain of the vessel, instead of encouraging so laudable a disposition, tied her by the wrist and placed her in a position so as to make her a spectacle to the whole crew. In this situation, he beat her, but not thinking the exhibition had made sufficiently conspicuous, he tied her up by the legs and then also beat her. But his cruel ingenuity was not yet exhausted, for the next he tied her up by one leg, after which she lost all sensation and in the course of three days expired. This was an indisputable fact. And so reading along in the transcripts of the um, speech is quite remarkable because it breaks off at this point and you have um, kind of parenthetical remarks and people are screaming from the house, name, name, name. They want um, William Wilberforce to name the identity of the captain. And he says, Captain Kimber was the man. And then he adds, if anything in the, could in the annals of human depravity go beyond this, he owned that he did not know where to look for it. The impassioned debate that followed the speech on that April day in 1792 is surely one of the more momentous in the history of oratory. The House stayed in session throughout the entire night. It's been, you know, there's films about this. You can, <laughs> you can watch um, various versions of it. And uh, this is with the moment when the slave trade was um, abolished. Okay, so the furor that caused, was caused by Wilberforce's speech in the House so the fear of Causeway Wilberforce's performance in Parliament was widely reported in the British press. And then, seven days later, Londoners were able to gaze upon the young girl's murder for themselves. A hand-colored print depicting the beating that Wilberforce described 
began appearing in coffee houses and taverns all over London. It was drawn by the Scottish illustrator Isaac Cruikshank, and the picture portrays the event in question at its apex. The nearly naked girl is strung up by one leg while the ship's captain leers over the scene whip in hand. The sailor who holds the girl up by the rope expresses an ambivalence through his grimace and also with a thought caption that says, damn me if I like it, I have a good mind to let go. The main caption editorializes, goes the abolition of the slave trade or the inhumanity of dealers in human flesh exemplified in Captain Kimber's treatment of a young Negro girl of 15 for her virgin modesty. It later gets modified when uh, Kimber um, sues. Okay, so here too then, at the, one of the origin points for our notions of universal human rights, which is to say the abolition of slavery, we have politics that occurs at the level of the visual. Spectators are called upon to look at evidence of atrocity, and their feelings are manipulated by subtle and not so subtle rhetorical strategies, and they are asked to judge in exactly the way that Josh was outlining. I could cite any number of other instances from the historical record to show how over and over, again and again, human rights claims function at the level of the visual, and they target as their audience the world spectator. <clears throat> okay, in the last few minutes, I just wanna say a few words about that term, the world spectator. It's an etymology that's complicated and it can be traced back at least to Kant, as Josh pointed out, who used a very similar term when he was speaking about the French Revolution. For him, as Josh, I think, made clear, what was important about the French Revolution was not what was happening on the streets. It wasn't about the right to revolt. Kant, you were quite right, thinks that, that revolution is really a state committing suicide because it's killing its own legitimacy. And so for him, the point of the revolution was important because it created spectators to it, spectators at a distance. And the political theorist Hannah Arendt noticed this in her late work, and she went to great lengths to define the arena of politics as a matter of spectatorship. And she did that by dragging Kant's aesthetic theory back to the political realm. So I, don't, I won't go through that too much, but she had a great way of doing it in a nutshell, which was that um, she used a parable which I, I, I just love parables, they, they're easy to remember, which was, she talked about the great games of humanity and the Greeks, and that the three kinds of people would go to the great games, the Olympic games, in the ancient sense. There'd be, there'd be the people who wanted to participate, they were the actors, and they were after fame and glory, and they wanted to be champions. There are the people that come to buy and sell things, and they love profit, they love trade and barter. And then there are the people that come just to watch, and so for Arendt, this was an important category, and the category of the spectator was the one that could have the best view of the action. And for her, this is, she, so she's shifting politics to the territory of the spectator. So Arendt proposes an altogether different way to approach and to define the political sphere. Here, the concept of the political is not defined by action, even though Arendt, of course, is famous for defining politics exactly that way in her early work. Events are transformed into world events, into phenomena that is of larger significance to human history through the judgment of distant spectators. So all to say, while several scholars have noted the importance of narrative, Professor Slaughter being chief among them, for the very legibility of human rights, I think when we consider the culture of human rights, we also need to think about the significance of the visual cultural forms. What would seem to be at stake here is the politics of aesthetics. The world spectator has a starring role in the political arena through her practices of looking, judging, and thinking. And taken through this lens, human rights are about much more than the specific events and actions that take place on the world stage. They are about events and actions that also take place in the minds of distant spectators. Thank you. Thank you.